This is the first in a series of computer science lessons about wireless communication and digital signal processing. In these lessons, you'll learn about the nature of electromagnetic radiation, digital modulation and multiplexing techniques, and how to get the best out of mobile communication systems such as LTE, 5G, and of course, Wi-Fi. Before we look in detail at wireless communication, let's begin with some of the physical phenomena that underpin wireless technologies, starting with electromagnetic waves. As early as 1865, the Scottish scientist and mathematician James Clerk Maxwell used mathematics to predict the existence of radio waves before they were even discovered. He realised that a charged particle is surrounded by an electric field. And if that particle accelerates, a magnetic field is produced at right angles to the electric field. These two fields interact with each other, which in turn results in self-propagating electromagnetic waves that spread out in three dimensions. These electromagnetic waves can travel through the vacuum of space at nearly 300 million metres per second. In 1886, the German physicist Heinrich Hertz proved Maxwell's theories were correct by building a device that could transmit and receive invisible electromagnetic waves. At first, they were named Hertzian waves, but later became known as radio waves. Hertz was also able to prove that radio waves travelled at the same velocity as visible light and were therefore essentially the same thing. Ironically, Hertz said that he didn't think these waves would have any practical application. One way to generate radio waves is by means of a half-wave dipole antenna. Variations of this simple device are commonly used by Wi-Fi access points. It converts electrical energy into electromagnetic energy. An alternating voltage is applied to a pair of metal rods which forces charged particles to accelerate from one pole to another. And because they're accelerating, they emit an electric field and a magnetic field at right angles to that. These fields result in waves of electromagnetic energy that spread out like expanding donuts. The direction of one of these wavefronts at any particular point in space depends on the position of the antenna. The shape of this radiation pattern explains why a receiver might experience a poor signal depending on the position of the wireless access point. You'll often see polarised electromagnetic waves depicted like this, but it would be quite wrong to think they were made of arrows and wavy lines. What you can see here is an abstract representation of how the strength of the electric field is changing in one direction, while the strength of the magnetic field is changing at right angles to it. The direction that the wave energy is travelling in is at right angles to both fields. Bear in mind then that this is more of a three-dimensional chart than a picture. When visualising electromagnetic waves as a computer scientist, it's convenient to think of only one component, the electric field, for example. It also helps us to imagine these waves propagating in two dimensions only, like ripples on the surface of a pond. At any given point in space, the electric field strength increases and decreases rhythmically as an electromagnetic wave passes through it. This oscillation can be represented on a graph of field strength versus time. The simple shape you can see here is known as a sine curve. The amplitude is an indication of the amount of power an electromagnetic wave contains. For a simple sine wave, the amplitude can be shown as the maximum height of the wave. We call this the peak amplitude. Amplitude can also be measured from peak to peak, like this. In reality, electromagnetic waves gradually lose power as they spread through free space. So the amplitude decreases over time. We say that electromagnetic waves attenuate as they travel. Furthermore, as you'll see later, radio waves are rarely simple sine waves. 
A more meaningful way to measure amplitude is to take an average over time. The amplitude is measured at several equally spaced intervals. Each value is squared to cater for negative numbers, then these are averaged to produce the so-called root mean squared amplitude, or RMS amplitude. The distance between any two corresponding points on the wave is known as the wavelength. The wavelength, which is measured in metres, can be seen here, for example, or here, or here. Look at a sine wave and you can see that there's a repeating pattern which represents one complete oscillation of the wave. It's known as a cycle. The number of cycles per second is called the frequency of the wave. The standard unit of frequency is the hertz. So this graph represents a wave that's oscillating at a higher frequency. There are more cycles per second. Notice that if the frequency is higher, the wavelength is shorter. It's worth observing the relationship between a sine wave and a circle. This will help us to describe the nature of electromagnetic waves later and how they can be made to carry information. Notice a point on the edge of the circle rotating anti-clockwise at a constant speed. If we plot a graph of the vertical position of this point against time, we can see that it traces out the path of a sine curve. One complete rotation of the circle, that is 360 degrees, corresponds to one cycle of the sine wave. When we plot a graph of the horizontal position of the point against time, a similar shape is produced, but it differs from the sine wave by a quarter of a turn of the circle. This is called a cosine wave. This brings us to another important property of waves, namely phase. Phase is not really a characteristic of a wave on its own. It's a measure of where, or should I say when, a wave is in its cycle if compared with another wave of the same frequency. Here are two identical waves. They have the same frequency and therefore the same wavelength. Furthermore, their cycles begin and end at the same time, so their oscillations are perfectly synchronised. These waves are said to be in phase with each other. Here are two waves whose oscillations differ by half a cycle. They are half a cycle out of sync. You can think of the difference as half a rotation of the circle that you saw earlier. So we say that these waves are 180 degrees out of phase. And these two waves are a quarter of a cycle out of phase. That is, 90 degrees out of phase. As you've already seen, when the phase of a sine wave is shifted by 90 degrees, the resulting shape is known as a cosine. These two waves are said to be in quadrature. You will learn just how important this particular phase difference is later, when we look at modulation. In high school, we are taught that waves combine with each other when they collide. This is called linear superposition. The effects of linear superposition can be seen when ripples pass through each other on the surface of a pond. They produce a very distinctive interference pattern. When two waves of the same frequency meet in phase, they combine together. The resulting wave is the sum of the two, so it has higher peaks and deeper troughs. This is called constructive interference. On the other hand, if two similar waves meet 180 degrees out of phase, their peaks and troughs cancel each other out. This is called destructive interference. The effects of constructive and destructive interference can also be observed in Thomas Young's famous double slit experiment. Light is shone through a pair of narrow slits, resulting in two beams of the same frequency. They are seen to produce fringes on a screen, suggesting not only that constructive and destructive interference is taking place, but also that light is indeed a wave. Waves of different frequencies can also interfere with each other. 
When two or more waves are present in the same place at the same time, the resulting wave is simply the sum of the individual waves. However, it's important to realise that interference effects only happen when two waves are in the same place at the same time. It's also important to bear in mind that energy can be neither created nor destroyed. You can see this clearly by sending pulses down a stretch of rope. When two up pulses meet, they add together to produce a pulse which is the sum of the two, but only very briefly. Then they pass right through each other. In the same way, if an up pulse meets a down pulse, they cancel each other out, but only when they are in the same place at the same time. Then they continue on their way as if they had never met. Look again at these water waves. When two or more waves are present in the same place at the same time, they interfere with each other, but the individual waves nevertheless continue to spread out. The same principle applies to radio waves. There are thousands of devices broadcasting at different frequencies all the time, and their signals are bound to interfere with each other according to the rules of linear superposition. However, in free space, waves from different transmitters will interfere, but pass right through each other. The effects of interference only really matter at the receiver. Furthermore, these are not simple sine waves. They've been modified to carry information. So it's highly unlikely that two identical waves will meet at the receiver exactly 180 degrees out of phase at exactly the same time. Yes, interference does have an impact on wireless communication, but it doesn't make it impossible. The circuitry in a radio receiver is able to filter out all but only one, or at least a very narrow range of, frequencies. So, as long as these devices are transmitting at different frequencies, a receiver can easily isolate just one signal among a cacophony of many. When it comes to wireless computer networks and mobile phones, lots of devices may indeed be transmitting at the same frequency, in the same place, at the same time. The impact of interference is therefore a bigger issue. Later, you'll see how wireless network protocols can handle this.